Awesome. All right. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us. Happy Friday. So uh, I'm here to introduce Carson Look. I threw it off my phone as I do this. Carson Look is a mechanical engineer and researcher and OSU alum who is returning from a 13 month deployment at the Admonson Scott South Pole Station. Carson graduated from the Ohio State University with a BS in mechanical engineering in 2020, during which they researched means of decreasing the fuel consumption of jet engines at the OSU gas turbine lab. After graduation, they continued this work as an aerospace researcher at the NASA Glenn Research Center. And most recently, Carson completed a 13 month contract with the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics to deploy, the South Pole, to, deploy to the South Pole under the United States Antarctic program. Their work supported the BICEP-3 telescope, which observes the cosmic microwave background, which is the oldest light in the universe, to better understand cosmic inflation after the Big Bang. Cool stuff, I'm excited to hear about it, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Carson. Awesome, thanks, Karina. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carson, um, but you already know that. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about my year at the South Pole. So um, this talk is gonna be three-ish parts. Um, starting out with a quick FAQ, um, talk about a little bit about who I am um, and uh, what I did uh, up to going to the pole, what the route there looked like, and what you'll find when you get there. Um, so just starting out with a FAQ, um, everyone always asks, what's the weather like? Um, <laughs> well, it's cold. <laughs> um, so negative 102 Fahrenheit, that's, that sounds like a large negative number, but what does that mean? Um, so uh, at the South Pole in the winter, uh, we have a sauna. If you go from the sauna directly outside, any sweat on your skin evaporates immediately and then condenses above your head and then rains back down on you as, as snow. So for short, for a couple of seconds, you form your own rain cloud. Um, it's so cold that the first, one of the first pieces of advice I got from another winter over um, prior to the season was in the winter, don't touch your beard too much when you're outside because it will crack. All the hair follicles will crack and you will have half of a beard. Um, so yeah, it's cold. <laughs> it's also windy. Um, so not as windy as McMurdo, which gets the catabatic winds, but if you, uh, 25 knots, is a lot when it's already negative 70, negative 80 Fahrenheit. So that brings the wind chill uh, down to 130 uh, most days. Um, so combining these two things, it's very uncomfortable to be outside without wearing proper protection. But um, you know, being a human and having a penchant for defying nature, um, we always like to take pictures uh, like this. But I want you to know this is incredibly painful. <laughs> um, and we just do it for photos. <laughs> um, addition to freezing, uh, I also can't see because it's bright. Um, the snow and the clouds uh, during the summertime when it's 24-7 uh, daylight, it is so bright that you will get snow blindness within minutes. Um, if you haven't experienced snow blindness, it's kind of like if you uh, have a photo taken of you and they use flash and that part of your vision is dark for you know just a little bit. It's that ex except it's across your entire field of vision for tens of minutes. Um, or longer. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's cold and bright. It's also dry. Um, it's so cold that any humidity in the air freezes. Um, and that's important because um, when you're observing things like the cosmic microwave background, we'll talk about that uh, later on, uh, you want the air to be as dry as possible. So that makes this an excellent place to do a lot of uh, microwave astronomy. Uh, and then finally, it's high altitude which means low pressure. Um, that's one of the things that you have to compensate for uh, physiologically when you get there. Uh, it's so high up that um, you risk uh, high altitude cerebral edema, high altitude uh, pulmonary edema, basically your body being used to being at sea level pressure. And then in a couple of hours uh, going basically up, you know, to Denver's of elevation. Um, so continuing on. What was animal like? Uh, there are none. <laughs> That's what it was like. Uh, polar bears in Antarctica, no. At the South Pole, also no. That was that nor That's North, Par North Pole animal. Penguins uh, in Antarctica, absolutely. 
But at the South Pole, no, it's too cold. Um, in addition to no animals, there's also no plants, um, no mountains or valleys, and no crevasses for the most part. Um, we're on three kilometers of ice on the Antarctic Plateau. It's very flat, it's very uniform. Um, so even crevasses, which are cracks in the ice that can go down hundreds of feet um, and then have like little ice bridges on them, like nature's pitfall traps, um, those luckily are not at the South Pole. So you can just walk around wherever you want to and don't have to worry about falling into a pit forever, um, which is great. So what does it actually look like? What, what's there if there's nothing there? Uh, it looks like this. Um, and this is on a nice day. Uh, it looks like this it, for hundreds of miles in every direction. Um, but most of the time it looks like this. So um, you are in a big white void uh, that extends forever in every direction. A um, Couple more questions. Uh, do you get a lot of sun? Yes, in the sky, uh, it's 24 seven sun for six months, 24 seven darkness for the other six months. We get one day per year. Um, we got little keychains when they when we got there, they said, hey, we have a winter over gift for you. We don't have locks to our doors um, for fire regulation reasons, but um, you know, we got these keychains that says, uh, uh, come for a day, stay for a year. <laughs> um, but on your skin, you don't get any. Uh, it's so cold, you know, negative 30s, pretty, pretty cold still. Um, so you can't really have any exposed skin outside. Um, inside, you still don't really get any sun. Uh, so no sunlight for pretty much the whole year. How isolated is it? Uh, well, first I wanted to make out a, make a point. Antarctic is big. Uh, so going to the South Pole, which is roughly in the middle uh, from the coast is 840 miles. Um, so we're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then there's three months of summer in which you can reach the station. Um, for the other nine months, it's too cold to land planes. Um, there are medevacs that are sometimes possible, uh, but that's not something to be relied upon. Um, it's incredibly dangerous and incredibly expensive. So generally for nine months of the winter, uh, if you're there, you're just there. Um, there are 44 people in the winter, uh, for my winter, about 150 in the summer, um, and we have reliable internet communication, that's about four and a half hours a day uh, because we rely on satellites that are meant to observe where people are and we people aren't. Uh, what the Thing movie is closest? Uh, 1982, but uh, yeah. So who am I? Um, well, I'm telling you because this is relevant to if you if you are interested in going there, what sorts of characteristics, what sorts of background might be might be relevant to to work down there. Um, so uh, I graduated from uh, OSU in 2020, uh, and as far as prior research, uh, I'm I'm a builder. I like to make things. I like to uh, work with complex machines. So uh, my first job was in prototype fa fabrication with Honda, um, making making vehicles that will be deployed in four or five years. Uh, on. From there, I went into uh, jet engines. I'm like, oh, cars are interesting. Um, not really, I don't like cars. But jet engines, those are cool, right? So I went in there and I went to the LSU gas turbine lab. Uh, I continued that work uh, when I went to NASA. Um, and I kind of think of my career as like a, a Plinko board. Um, if you don't know what it is, here's what it looks like. You kind of put a disc in in a random place and you don't know where you're going to end up and it kind of bounces around randomly and you get some arbitrary price for it. Um, yeah, so I took, a, I took a bounce off one of those nails there and ended up in cosmology. Um, you know, I was thinking all these complicated machines, I really wanna get back to basics. So um, I studied the beginning of the universe with bicep three. So uh, 13 months at the South Pole, um, doing research for cosmology, learning about the beginning of the universe. Uh, from that work there, uh, I got a Congressional Medal um, for Antarctic Service, and uh, yeah, now I'm here. So talking about kind of the mindset of being at the South Pole, um, if you want to go there, if you're interested in it, uh, first of all, it's important to note it's a long journey. Um, you have to have a lot of mental endurance. Um, you know, if 
I'm always interested in working on these complicated machines, the telescope, a jet engine, things like this. Uh, I thought, oh, Antarctica, that'd be kind of cool. I've heard that's a continent, what's over there? Um, and that was roughly three or four years ago. Um, and I you know, came here and learned a bit about it. I talked to lots of people who've been to the field. I ended up applying, got rejected, applied again, um, got said, okay, maybe, and then yes, and then went to Boston and trained for three months and then came to the South Pole. So all of that to say, it takes a long time to get there. Uh, it takes a lot of endurance and you have to have that same mindset once you're there. Once you're there, you've got nine months and um, there you cannot leave uh, and you have to keep yourself busy. You need to be able to sustain yourself. You need to be aware of your own emotions. Um, and these are all very important things for staying sane and staying effective for that winter. Um, all of that to say though, don't be too serious. Well, to, you know, serious sounds like it'll get you there, it'll get you, you know, you're studious, you've got good grades, you've got good jobs, whatever. But once you're there, you can't be serious all the time. It's such an intense environment that you need to be able to relax. You need to kind of decompress because it's such an intense experience. Um, without levity, uh, you're, you're not going to flourish. And all that too is you work with people. You know, you might be away from the population, but you're not away from people. In fact, you're as close to people as you could possibly imagine. It's like uh, if you were in a college dorm and then they locked all the doors and said, okay, in a year we'll open them up. Um, once you're there, you're next to people all of the time and you have to be nice to them. Being nice is really important um, because uh, sometimes you'll get impatient. Sometimes you'll think something's happening. Um, you have different perspectives on issues and all of that to say, you need to work with people. You need to have kindness and compassion um, in order to in order to flourish, you need to you need to be nice. Um, one last thing, uh, what I call mixed ice relationships. So when you're on the continent, we call it being on ice. Uh, and if one of you is there and one of you isn't there, uh, it's hard to talk. You know, you only have a couple hours of internet per day. Um, so, you know, uh, when I got there, they told me so. Are you dating anyone? I'm like, yes. They're like, are they here? No. Oh, well, that's probably going to end. <laughs> I hope it was good. Follow well, lasted. I'm like, oh, thank, th thank you. <laughs> He's like, nothing about you. I'm just saying statistically, it's very likely that. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and uh, I, I can see why. It's it's a very it's a demanding environment. You have to work extra hard to talk with people. You can't see them in things that you say over the phone. Uh, you know, it can be garbled. So uh, that's all to say, it's not impossible. Um, this is me and my partner, Ollie. Shout out to Ollie here in the front row. Um, and as you guessed, we're still together. So this is after. Um, but it's possible. Uh, it's, it's not just guaranteed you will break up with, you know, have any significant relationship you have, but it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of dedication. Um, so you need to go in there thinking about that. So let's talk about the route there. Um, look at the landscape. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the geographic landscape of Antarctica, uh, but let's talk about the, the human presence, um, the organizational landscape. So these are different bases around the, the continent. Um, there's 46 in total, uh, they're year round, but then almost double that or more than double that uh, in, year, in seasonal stations. Now seasonal stations are um, there, you go there for the summer, you pack it up and leave in the winter uh, because it's cold. It's hard to live in Antarctica. It's hard to have enough supplies to survive the winter, uh, have contingency planning if there's emergencies. Um, you know, vehicles don't like to run in the winter. You have to have fuel, you have to have food. Um, that's very hard to do. So there's a lot of places we want to look at that are just too difficult to support um, year round. So uh, all of that. Uh, together represents about 33 countries. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the international presence in Antarctica because I was in one place, I was at the South Pole. So I'm going to talk about the US presence. Um, so there's three main stations there. The middle one is the South Pole Station. Um, the bottom one is McMurdo and the top is Palmer. Those are the US Antarctic program um, in addition to field camps. Um, there's a number of places that we want to study that either putting you know, a base with 
between 44 and McMurdo, thousands of people next to will disrupt the environment um, that you want to study. So there are field camps that are more remote, um, that are traveled to uh, seasonally uh, to conduct studies uh, about areas a little bit further away from the station. There's also two research vessels um, that study the waters outside of the continent. So looking at the USAP program, we have, uh, starting with the US government, the independent office, uh, independent agency of the National Science Foundation, which then has the Office of Polar Programs, uh, which runs USAP, which is the United States Antarctic Program. Now there's kind of two sides to it. Um, you've got the science side and you've got the contractors. Um, so on the contract side, that's everything you need to live. That's food, that's um, maintaining engines, that's transport, transportation, that's heavy equipment, um, basically anything logistics, building facilities wise that you need to do your science and to be alive. And that's uh, contracted by Lidos right now uh, that moves around every couple of years. And then they subcontract to a bunch of people. Um, all of this information is publicly available, but uh, it's kind of a complicated web of many different organizations. They each do a small part um, so I'm kind of trying to give you an overall picture of what the program looks like, and then you can kind of dig down to figure out uh, more specifics. So on the science side, you're probably most familiar with institutions. Um, there's a bunch of collaborations. There are a set of institutions to work on a large project, um, and then individual ones. Individual institutions are not as common in the program um, because it's expensive to be down there. It, it takes a lot of expertise. So to do that, um, a lot of them combine together to, to work on these larger projects. These ones at the top here are ones at South Pole. Um, you're probably not also as familiar with US agencies. Um, so there's a number of ones that do science down there. Um, one that stands out in this list is the US Air Force. Um, we, have, we don't have a runway at the South Pole. We have compacted snow and it's hard to land thousands of tons of equipment on snow. Uh, so you need specialized equipment, you need specialized planes, specialized training and crew, and the U.S. Air Force provides that um, on a purely logistical standpoint. So um, this is kind of like the main trunk and branches of it, uh, but you have to really dig a lot to, to get down to actual, an actual job posting, an actual position. Um, and so let's dig a little bit. Um, this is the bicep cap collaboration. That's the one I worked for. Um, so let's see what that looks like. Uh, there are two experiments in the bicep keck, uh, bicep three and bicep array. Um, those two are run by all of these institutions. Um, and 13 in total. That sounds like a lot, but you have to think this is a very complicated instrument. It's a telescope. It has optical properties. It has mechanical properties um, that you have to be in a very tight range to look at what we're trying to look at. We have data science. We have uh, mechanics, we have ast astronomy, um, all of those parts are kind of split up. Uh, I worked specifically uh, at the area that was looking at optics. So before I deployed, I was helping develop uh, new instrument optics for the next generation of telescopes. Um, all of that, though, is going to be wrapped up into a larger project called CMBS4. CMB is Cosmic Microwave Backgrounds, that's what we're looking at, and S4 for stage <laughs> I, it's not the fourth time we've looked at it, I swear. Um, it's like the 98th time, but that S4 sounds better than S98. Uh, so that's 117 organizations, which is dispersed both institutionally and geographically. Um, but all that to say, we're putting out way more telescopes. So it's 21 versus two. Um, it just grows and grows and grows in complexity. Uh, kind of think of if you're trying to host a dinner party and uh, instead of everyone bringing a dish, everyone brings a couple of ingredients for one dish uh, with rough hand-drawn sketches of what the rest of the ingredients might look like. Then you have to fill all together and assemble it on the moon. Um, so that's kind of what we're working with here. Uh, so I worked on this area, um, more specifically here and more and more specifically here. So that's actually kind of a, dram a dramatization. I was much smaller part of Harvard than just that corner. Um, but let's talk about the research. 
So looking at the research, let's start geographically again. Um, so if you have the South Pole in the middle, uh, it's divided into sectors. Um, each sector has a different field that it's specialized towards. You have the dark sector, um, which has bicep three, bicep array, as well as the South Pole telescope. Um, not the only South Pole telescope, but the South Pole telescope. Um, those are all microwave astronomy instruments. Um, dark, the dark sector is radio dark. So we have no radio communication going in or out. Um, and that's important because we're using instruments that are very, very sensitive to electromagnetic radiation. So using your handheld radio, using your cell phone, using Bluetooth, any of that would disrupt these instruments. Um, we also have uh, astronomy of a slightly different type. Uh, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory uh, can detect particles that fly through the earth and then come out the other side and decay just before they breach the surface. And those can be detected um, as tiny, tiny flashes of light in very rare instances. There's tens of thousands of them going through your body every second, but they don't interact with a lot of stuff. So on the you know very, very rare instance they do, you want a large detector so you have the best chance of capturing them. Um, and that would be a one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer cube of very sensitive light detectors buried to the bedrock, um, three kilometers down in the ice. Um, that's still not big enough, so we're making it 10 times larger, uh, which adds its own complexities, but that's all in the dark sector. Um, the clean air sector here uh, is where the NOAA lab is. Um, so they are collecting information about baseline air measurements. And if I actually go back here just a little bit, um, this is what the Atmospheric Research Observatory looks like. Um, Aero is a um, kind of a baseline air monitoring station. It's important to get a sense of what the climate could be, what the air could be at the absolute cleanest it is on the planet. Um, so by having this instrument, uh, having these series of instruments where we take air samples, where we have direct ozone measurements, um, we can get all of that information uh, and kind of compare it to different parts on Earth. Um, and this isn't the only one. There's, uh, there's uh, these instruments located at different latitudes um, from South Pole all the way up to Barrow, Alaska. Um, and this laser here is uh, how we talk to the alien mothership. So mm -hmm. when we have uh, our planning invasion, uh, wait, so I mean clouds, uh, that's how we monitor clouds, cloud height in that place. Anyway, uh, so, that's the clean air sector. Um, we have a big place that you're not allowed to fly planes because we don't want to measure a tailpipe. We want to measure the earth. Um, so you can't fly over there. Uh, that brings us to the quiet sector. So the Espresso experiment is the world's most uh, sensitive seismometer. So it can detect earthquakes in the entire southern hemisphere of the planet um, because we're very far away from it and we don't touch it and uh, there aren't any other humans around to create seismic activity in general. Um, so that's located about five miles away from station. Um, next to it, and there's nothing else around, next to it we have the downwind sector. Um, we have to be able to get to the station. So that's where we fly planes in. Um, that's where we uh, drive in the uh, spot team, which is a, a series of tractors, which pull all of our fuel, um, 300, all 300,000 pounds of it, uh, those 840 miles from McMurdo to the pole. Um, that takes about 40 days, one direction. So uh, it takes pretty much the whole summer for us to be refueled for the following winter. Uh, we have the South Pole Station itself too. Um, not all instruments need to be um, in their own remote buildings. So we have uh, cameras on the top of the station that can measure the aurora. Uh, magnetically, visibly, uh, measure their speed, and that all tells us about space weather, um, charged particles coming from the sun, interacting in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, uh, and we can learn more about the Earth's magnetic field that way. So let's kind of zoom out here. Um, that's how big the clean air sector is. Um, looking at the inset there, we have McMurdo and South Pole. Um, and then inside of that, inside the MAP2 inset is what we just looked at. Inside of that, is uh, kind of a closer look at the area. That's our ski way there. So we get planes in and out. And then this is kind of what the buildings look like. 
Uh, Dark Sector Laboratory is right there. That's where I worked. And then the station is where everyone lives. So uh, you have to walk out multiple times a week, sometimes multiple times a day uh, to maintain all of these experiments out in the, in the well, it's not really deep field, but further away from station. Um, Arrow is there in the corner of the clean air sector. And then we also have food and fuel storage. Um, those are the, we call the arches. Um, they were at ground level, um, but now they're buried three stories underground. Um, so we kind of dig out the fronts so we can drive cars in and out. Um, well, not really cars, but vehicles. Uh, and everything that we need that we could possibly not go outside to get, um, th those are in the arches. So food, fuel, um, delicate materials, things like that. And then we have storage. So this is everything that we can put outside. We don't need immediately, or it's very big and heavy. Um, and these do get buried. Um, it's, yeah, the snow never melts at the South Pole. So we need to uh, basically bulldoze between these multiple times a year to keep them from being completely buried and lost. Um, looking at the ground, here's what that looks like. So this is the dark sector. That building there is MAPO, Martin A. Pomerantz Observatory. Um, it has a series of experiments now called Bicep Array. And then further than that, uh, this looks close, but because there's nothing else to compare it to, everything looks close and it's miles away. Um, so DSL is still about half a mile, maybe, maybe a quarter mile, maybe a third of a mile. Um, and it has a series of experiments now known as BICEP-3. Um, then we've got two other things here, South Pole Telescope. And um, it, it took years of research, but scientists finally agree uh, the LC-30 is definitely not a telescope. <laughs> Um, so looking inside of BICEP3, here's what it looks like. So uh, BICEP3 is that one over there. Um, and it was, it's designed to study the oldest light in the universe, the cosmic microwave background. Um, how do we know it's the oldest light? Because it's the furthest away. So if you look at the sun, the light coming from the sun left the sun seven minutes ago. So we're looking at a seven minute old picture of what the sun looks like when we look in that direction. Now, if we look at Pluto, it's five and a half hours away. Um, if you look further than that, beyond our uh, solar system, beyond our galaxy, uh, then you can see beyond everything, you can see the oldest thing in the universe, which is the big, the, what was left of the Big Bang. And that's the cosmic microwave background. So that light is the oldest, um, but it's also, uh, hard to see because everything else is in the way. So I'll talk a little bit about how we how we fix that problem. How's the telescope work? Uh, well, we've got the mount, which is that thing in blue, and we have the camera. Um, so this cryostat has all the optics, has all the sensors, um, has the refrigerator um, that we need to to look. Um, you think, oh, it's the South Pole. It's you know cold enough, right? No, it's actually hundreds of degrees Celsius warmer than what we need. So the Krauss set is a quarter Kelvin, so negative 273 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that's because what we're looking at is the sky and the CMB, which is very cold, it's 2.7 Kelvin. Um, so if you were to look at it uh, with a room temperature instrument, you just could not see anything. Like you take a piece of metal and you, you heat it up red hot and it's glowing, right? Well, if it cools down, it's still glowing. It's glowing in the infrared spectrum. So if you point an IR heat gun at it, you can, you can see that, that warmth, that you can see that light coming off of it. It cools down further, it's still glowing in the microwave spectrum. We're looking at the microwave spectrum. So anything that's warmer than absolute zero is still glowing and it's glowing very brightly in the microwave spectrum at room temperature. So, or even Antarctica temperature. So we need to make it as cold as, as possible um, to get the cleanest signal we can. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the most boring part of the sky. We're looking at the place where there's almost nothing. Um, that stripe down there is the Milky Way. Uh, we want to see as little as possible because we're trying to look at the far, far background. Um, looking at the telescope itself, uh, the mount is the biggest, most obvious part. It has a very important job of pointing at something with very high precision. Um, you know, a one, deg one degree error from me to the wall might be you know, a couple of millimeters. 
a one degree error from here to the end of the universe is hundreds of light years. So we have to be much, much more precise if we want to look where we want to look. Um, the receiver is the eyes, like I talked about before. Um, that's mounted into the mount. It's hundreds of pounds, so it makes it a little bit more complicated to use. Uh, it also has a lot of wires attached to it. So making sure those wires are not damaged by the movement is something important to consider, uh, especially because we have to rotate more than 360 to compensate for the Earth rotating. If we point it just one direction in the sky, the Earth's going to turn us in the wrong direction. Um, we have the control systems. So that's all these racks here. Um, that controls movement, that controls data, um, health monitoring, and then we have the data which comes off of those crates, which read off the detectors, and then go over there to those computers. Um, and from there, it's a very simple journey. Um, it just goes from those servers uh, through an op fiber optic cable half a mile to the servers at station, which then send it to the satellite terminal, which then bounces off the satellite in orbiting the Earth, uh, which then bounces it back down to Christchurch, New Zealand, which then goes through an undersea cable to Holyoke's Virginia, where it then goes to the uh, Odyssey supercomputer and analyzed by uh, 100, 100 grad students across the US. So we made it as simple as possible. <laughs> FAQ about the telescope. What can you see through the telescope? Uh, well, personally, nothing, nothing at all. It's opaque. But let's say you could put my head inside of the telescope where the, where the light is coming in. What could I see? Uh, still nothing, I would die instantly because it's a quarter Kelvin. Um, but if I didn't die, uh, I would see nothing because I can't see microwaves. Um, so uh, kind of the, the sense of astronomy is it's still like this where you look through a, a, a long stick and you draw a nice picture and then show it to people. Um, but modern astronomy is kind of like a machine <laughs> looking through a long stick and then it puts out a lot of data that doesn't look very interesting. But okay, I get what you're saying. Like, what, so all of that, whatever, like what does it look like if you like plot the data? Um, it looks like this. <laughs> um, it's like the CMB is so enormously uniform. It's the, one of the most uniform things in the entire universe. Like that's how we know it's from the Big Bang because if we look over there and we look over there, those two places are so far apart from each other, light has never reached one end to the other. So uh, it's not possible for them to have talked to each other, for them to have interacted in any meaningful way. So why would they be the same? Um, it's because the universe used to be smaller um, and those were closer together and they, they started from the same place. But let, let's, okay, so I'm, I'm being coy, whatever. Let's look at what does it look like if you be really, really sensitive. Um, it looks like static. Uh, but it's very interesting static to some people. Um, but if you want to know what bicep three is looking at, we're looking at polarization specifically, B mode polarization, um, which tells us uh, different characteristics about cosmic inflation um, immediately after the Big Bang. So Big Bang happened, the universe got way bigger really quickly, and it's still getting bigger, but much slower than it did. So that's all the science about that. Let's talk about the station. So uh, the station, uh, here's what it looks like. Um, this is destination alpha there. That was the previous picture. That's what you will see when you come in. You've got the geographic south or the ceremonial south pole. The geographic south pole uh, is close by, but uh, it's very inconvenient because it moves around. The earth wobbles a little bit. So the south pole is here and then it's 10 meters that way. And then it's 20 meters that way. Um, very inconvenient for us humans who want to take nice pictures. So we just made our own, which is better, um, because it's there and it's in front of the station. Uh, but we also mark the geographic one um, each year. We just have to have a cart cartographer come out and find it for us. Uh, we have the balloon launch facility over there. Um, and then the storage berms. Uh, we launch balloons that look like this. Um, I'm helping out the meteorology team. Uh, we do this multiple times a day to gather information about the upper atmosphere. Um, and this informs weather models uh, for pretty much the whole Southern hemisphere because we're the only manned observing station for hundreds of miles. Um, here's what some of the planes look like. That's an LC-130. Um, that's bringing us a pallet of food. This is a smaller plane. This is a, I think it, that's a twin otter. Um, so that's bringing us uh, people. 
Um, it's also used to go out to the deep field. So this is a crew coming in from the deep field. Um, who, I don't know what they were doing, but I put food, I put fuel in the plane uh, because the, the fuelies, the people who fuel the planes, um, they are only there for the summer. So in the winter, there's still planes leaving you know, after they leave and coming before they come. So uh, part of my job was to put fuel in them, which is difficult because uh, seals, pumps, all those things are meant to work at normal temperatures. And this is negative 70. Aerial view of the station. You've got the science and you've got the support. Looking the other direction, you've got these golf balls over here. Those are the satellite receivers. They look like this up close. Um, that's a piston bully down there. Um, so there are vehicles, we can use them, especially got espresso, but uh, generally the vehicles run on fuel, which is hard to get down there. And also they don't run for most of the winter. So uh, you need to have strong legs. Um, this is the another view of one of the other um, receivers. This is what the arches look like. So going from the arches to the station, you go through this tunnel. Um, this is the power plant. Um, so uh, we have to generate our own power because we can't connect to a grid anywhere. Um, so we have, uh, I'm, I'm there. I, they, I swear they, allowed, they let me in there. I don't know why, but uh, so they need to look at these 24 seven. Um, and if something breaks, we lose power. We need to get it up right away because that's all our heat and that's how we stay alive. Um, so uh, they do rounds multiple times a day, check on all the systems. Uh, they need a vacation sometimes. So uh, I volunteered as many, as many others do uh, throughout the winter to uh, go down, just read the ga gauges. And um, you know, it's kind of like babysitting, but like the most tamest level of babysitting. So they look at it and like, oh, it's doing something weird. And I call someone and wake them up in the middle of the night to go fix it. <laughs> I don't know how to fix any of this. I can read a number and this sheet can tell me if it's wrong. Uh, this is where the fuel looks like. Um, this is the fuel arch. Um, there's uh, you know, over 300,000 pounds of fuel. Um, I don't know if that is gallons. Um, it's low temperature uh, Divide diesel. Divide by six. Hmm? Divide by six. Divide by six. I can't do math. <laughs> I use the computers for that. Um, so uh, we have to store it all to stay running. We have the vehicle base. Uh, so we have a series of bulldozers that maintain the snow, keep it away from the station, keep it away from the buildings and push it off. We call it the end of the world. Um, this is the inside. So the maintenance technicians work in there and make sure that these, these machines keep operating. Um, and then all of that to maintain the elevated station. And the elevated station is everything you need to live for a year. So this is the galley. Wow. There is a uh, commercial kitchen uh, yeah. in the back there. Uh, and they supply us, you know, all of our, us winter rovers for, um, the, for the whole year. Uh, there's also uh, laundry facilities, um, entertainment. We've got a library um, and we've got a gym. Over the winter, I, I taught martial arts and I traded off with the, uh, the person who does parkour. So uh, just kind of things to stay active, keep your body healthy. You're burning um, about 5,000 calories a day, uh, keeping your body warm, operating in this extremely cold environment. Um, and you know, without with all that, you still have to work out other parts of your body. You can't just be uh, carrying heavy things all day. So this is kind of to stretch out, keep your keep your joints uh, nimble. Uh, we had an indoor 5K, so I skated. I brought my skateboard. That's my skateboard from home uh, to the South Pole. And there's not a lot of paved surfaces in the snow, so as a nun, so it was down in the hallway, back and forth. Uh, I think it was 20 laps. <laughs> Um, we also have, that's the hallway, uh, you know, that's kind of what looking down the station is. That's what we call the beer can down at the bottom, uh, that leads down into the arches. Uh, we have firefighting equipment too, um, because you can't call the fire department when you're 840 miles away from the nearest people. You have to be the fire department. 
So half of the station is trained in fire, half the station roughly is trained in uh, medical trauma. So I was part of the trauma team. Uh, so if the fire alarm goes off, you don't just leave the building because you'd freeze. Um, you get geared up, you get your fire gear on. I would run to the clinic, uh, that's the clinic. Um, man the radio station, make sure that we can coordinate a medical response um, because you know, that what, what was here is what is here for nine months. Um, and that's kind of something you have to accept. We don't have a surgery center. We don't have uh, like an advanced trauma center. We have a small clinic with one doctor and one PA. So uh, you have to accept that you do the best you can. You, you are, be careful, but there's very limited resources there. And that's something that you just have to cope with. Um, there's engineering systems, the building heat, uh, the, uh, the electricity, the satellite communications. If there's some systems that if they fail, um, that's it, that's, that's all you have. So there's contingencies, but those contingencies aren't, you know, aren't infinite. So uh, yeah, you have to do what, do what you can with what you have. But overall, I'd say if I had to summarize the experience, I'd say uh, it's cold, it's dark, and <laughs> it's breathtaking. Any questions? Uh, yes. So, um... I know all people when I know them, they're inside the station. But when you've got that larger mass of people, mm -hmm. do you do they still have like the um, shelters that you live in? Uh, yeah, yeah. So among the berms, we have uh, the hypertats, which yeah. are like temporary structures. Yeah. Or I mean, they're, they're there all the time, but they're not lived in all the time. Uh, yes. Uh, so we try not to use them because they're not comfortable places to be. Um, but yeah, when we had transiting pilots, especially during COVID, we needed to isolate them. Um, we, we used the hypertats. Yes. I want to say it's been a really great presentation. Thank it. you. Um, I think most people here know that I did a similar thing 60 years ago mm -hmm. at a different station, mm -hmm. but I'm struck by two things. One, how many things are very similar, and mm -hmm. two, how many things are very, very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the scale and uh, I don't know what the right word is, the development mm -hmm. of the station at the pole, it, it just beggars the place that we wintered over in 1960. Mm -hmm. How many of the four, 44 people were logistical support people and how many were scientists? Yes, so uh, it was roughly a quarter to a third-ish scientists and then the remaining contractors. Um, so the major projects had uh, full-time staff, including BICEP, which I worked on, BICEP Array, Ice Cube, um, some of the smaller projects had uh, one scientist who had part-time devotion to each of those. Um, and then as among, among contractors, I'd say uh, most of the contractors are keeping the building running, keeping the heat running, keeping um, the engines and the water plant going. Uh, and then uh, the rest to, to different services that we need to, to keep running. So just roughly how many of the 44 were support and how many were science? Let's see, science, uh, about eight of the 44. Eight out of 44 were science. Yes. That's incredible, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but questions about, mm -hmm. so when the sun came back, mm -hmm. was it in the work for you? And did you celebrate the return? <laughs> um, the end of the work or the end of the world? <laughs> um, honestly, when I first saw the sun, it was frightening. Um, I I know it sounds ridiculous. Oh, no, the sun. But you haven't seen it for so long. It's kind of marking the beginning of change. And when 
everything has been static for nine months. You know, the weather is always cold and windy. The it, outside is always dark. Um, you know, the people who are there are just the people who are there. Um, and they're, at some points in the winter, it feels like the only people who exist. Um, yeah, it was kind of scary, uh, but it was also exciting because it meant I get to leave. Uh, <laughs> it was, yeah, it, I'm sorry, I can't forget the original question. Did it rain? Did it celebrate? Yes, we had sunrise dinner. Um, so we all dressed up fancy and um, put tablecloths on the tables in the galley and had a party. Uh, since your enthusiasm, my question is, mm -hmm. would you do it again? That's, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, it's a very intense experience. Um, I'd say ever, possibly, um, but immediately no, because it's just such a, it's, it's, it's marked by the sameness. It's marked by no change. Um, and uh, things not changing for a whole year is probably going to be the same as things not changing for a whole year. Um, there are people who go back year after year after year. Um, there's, I think the record is like 22 winters in a row. So winter, summer, somewhere for a couple months, come back winter, do that over and over and over. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, yes. Um, I have a similar question to Emily. So once your work is done, mm -hmm. then it takes about 40 days. Is that what you said to get to that when you're leaving the, the transportation or the logistics? So that's for the spot team, uh, which carries most of our cargo and our waste leaving the pole. Um, so you take a passengers generally take a LC-130, C-17, one of those larger planes. Um, it can take, though, a long time to actually leave because even in the absolute best conditions, uh, there's still mechanical breakdowns. There's still uh, weather windows that you have to meet. So even though you're scheduled to arrive or scheduled to leave at a specific time, um, it's you have to kind of uh, be ready to leave for weeks on end until you actually get to where you're trying to go. Going back to the Plinko board, what's the, are you continuing with BiTEP or is there something new that you're on to next? Or have you decided to go back to one of your previous? Um, that's difficult to answer. I don't know yet. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, right now I'm just kind of relaxing a little bit. It's taking a bit of a vacation. You know, it's, uh, it's been a long experience. So I think it's, it's right now is just the time to kind of reset, get back used to being a normal human in the society. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I don't know where I'll be next, but I'm excited to go there. Yes. What was the distance between South Pole Station and the Bicep Telescope? And That's, how long did it take you to walk there? So it's about half a mile. Um, walking time varied. Uh, at the beginning of season, so it took a long time for me to acclimate to the, the high altitude. Um, so, and it took an abnormally long time. Um, but I still, I did eventually, uh, I'd say late in the season, I could do it in maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, early in the season, it took like 40 minutes. And then if the weather was bad, I couldn't get there. Um, there's some, even with all of the protective gear, all like full clothing, hand warmers, toe warmers, uh, you just, you couldn't get there. Like you, I could feel the wind cutting through my coat. Um, I'd get 40% of the way there and be like, I'm not going to make it the rest of the way. I need to turn back right now. So um, definitely being aware of yourself, being aware of your, you know, physically, how you're doing, mentally, how you're doing. Uh, you have to, you have to kind of gauge, gauge risk versus, um, you know, the, the urgency of where you're trying to go. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So I have two quick questions. What does bicep mean? Bicep. It's a secret. Okay. Um, it used to stand for something, but then we decided we like the word bicep better. So. Well, the other question: <laughs> How much energy does it take to get that cold? Oh, it's good. Oh, that's a good question. You know, I I don't have the exact numbers. Um, I can tell you that when I turn the telescope on and off, 
uh, the power plant tells me they have a huge spike in demand <laughs> and uh, not to do that very often. <laughs> uh, yes. What was the ratio of the men to women? Men to women, uh, it's about one, one third women. Okay, because I was, I wintered in the bad old days where women were not allowed in Antarctica, period, mm. for anything. Mm. Even summer field parties have rarely had women. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Rosa Johnson. Yeah. Yes. Comment. Yes. And I have a question. I'll go with the question mm -hmm. first. Okay. Typically, like for remote field camps now, mm -hmm. anything you bring in, you you, you take out. Mm -hmm. uh, here, of course, it's 12 months. Yes. But I noticed the box says landfill. Yes. Um, are those type of things are going out, I think. Yes. Okay. So my next question is dealing with both the sewage and the brown water and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was there, essentially they had a they melted a big place in the ice. Yes. And so you had this big plume of stuff yes. that was never going to leave. And my question is, how do they handle that now? Um, get my okay, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> um, it hasn't really changed. Um, theoretically, they would dig it up in a while. I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> um, I yeah, it's it's a difficult problem because McBurdo they have a wastewater treatment plant mm -hmm. because they have access to the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, other places they incinerate it. Um, South Pole. We're very limited in our capacity to move volumes of like large volumes of waste. So that is not something that has changed all that much. Okay. So um, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> so now my comment is yeah. I want to compliment you, oh, thank you. And the students who are here about your persistence. Oh, thank you. You came to talk to me a number of times. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I sensed your passion. You were just trying to figure out when was the first time you came mm -hmm. to talk with me is well, who do I need to talk to? Yeah. And clearly you went away and you talked to people, etc. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this clearly for you was like a life goal. Mm -hmm. I could sense your passion for it. Mm -hmm. And so, but you didn't give up. Mm -hmm. And I think you serve as an example for the students. When their work, their thesis or dissertation gets higher, mm -hmm. hard, you just have to put your head down and keep on going. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you did that, I admire that. And oh, I'll thank you. you for it. Oh, thank you. Yes. I have some online questions. Sure, sure. Um, so this is a two part question. Okay. The first part is what route did you take to travel to Antarctica? Okay. And the second part is what what do you think about the increase in tourism to the Antarctic? Okay. Yes. Uh, so first question, how did I get there? Um, so that's relatively straightforward. Uh, I went from Columbus to Boston, stayed there for three months to train, then went to San Francisco quarantine three days, then went to Christchurch, New Zealand, quarantine 14 days, then flew to McMurdo Station on the coast, and then from McMurdo about a week and a half later to the South Pole. And what do you think about the increase in tourism to the Antarctic? Increase in tourism. It, that, it's, it's mixed because the more people who are there, the, you know, the larger the human impact on the environment, um, but it also increases awareness of the environment and interest in supporting uh, work there. I, I don't. I don't think that it's all good or all bad. Um, I think it's it's an interesting area. That's it's it's hard to hard to categorize. Um, all in all, I think it's it's good that people are interested in the continent. Um, I just hope that the interest is is more than surface level. Well, I put my foot on the ice and. You know, I'm done. That's the, the rest can go away. I don't care. Like I, I hope that there's sustained interest in them. Okay. Is there someone taking your role at the station now? And do you have to train this person a little bit? Yes. Yes. Um, so there is someone right there uh, right now, um, and I did train them for 
uh, it was a very rapid turnover. Um, I think I trained them on a year's worth of telescope experience in four days. Um, I do feel bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so you do as much pre-training as you can, but there's a lot of kind of experiential knowledge that you have to do your best to document. Um, I think one of the major reasons why they picked me um, is because I've experienced documenting things in very precise technical detail, but with enough um, brevity that you can you know, say, is this relevant to me, yes or no? Uh, and then if you need to know how did you, what went wrong and how do you fix it, that's really, really important to do because this is a lot of bits and pieces that have been put together and then aged for decades. So there's lots of things that are slightly broken that you need to know, oh, when it makes that noise, tap it with the hammer in this location. <laughs> Any more on my questions? Yeah, I actually do have one more. Um, could you tell us more about the results from the telescope and what you know about them? Yes. And maybe you can go back to that image too and look at it. Sure, more. sure. Thank you. Uh, so let's go back to that image. Oh boy. Okay. Um, Just see what I am. <laughs> There's some great pictures. Oh, thank you. I did take some of these. I can't claim credit for everything, though. Um, okay, so here's what that looks like. Um, so I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. Um, technically, my job was winter hyphen over engineer. Um, so my job was to keep the machine doing, making the sounds and spitting out the numbers that it does. So I had experience mostly with the health of the system, monitoring temperatures, monitoring, um, you know, looking at samples of data, saying, does the data stream look appropriate? Is the sensor dead? Is the sensor giving all ones or something like that? Or is it giving like a varying value in the range that we expect? Um, so I can't talk a ton about the science results. Um, there's a lot of papers and a lot of grad students who have done work on that. High level, um, what, what did I accomplish in a year? Uh, so we're looking at something in the background of the universe. So everything else that between us and that is in the way. So if you want to think of an example, if you're going to, let's say you went to the Eiffel Tower and you want to take a picture of it with no tourists in the way, uh, there's always tourists in the way. Um, so you take a picture, they're in the way, but you stay in the same place, you wait, and they've moved around. The background has not. You take another picture and you do that over and over for, let's say, an hour. All of the things in the foreground have moved, but all the things in the background have stayed the same. So you average all that together and you just get the background. So we're doing that in the sky. We're looking at a very distant point and taking pictures of it for years and years and years. And over time, we get a clearer picture because all of the foreground uh, effectively gets subtracted. So what I do in a year is I contributed to our understanding, to our map, a little bit of clarity in that picture. Um, and from that picture, we can better understand the starting conditions of the universe, what sorts of forces were at work that, that shaped what we look at today. So for example, if you're just looking at the absolute temperature map, which is over here, um, the places that were slightly warmer, like this is micro Kelvin, so 0 0.0001 Celsius difference. Um, and that's 300, 300 of them. Um, that difference will determine where, uh, or yeah, that will determine where galaxies eventually formed. So at the beginning, these fluctuations are due to the quantum differences at the subatomic level. But as that got larger and larger and larger, uh, if you have slightly more dust in this place than over here, the dust here will, by the forces of gravity approach, approach each other and then form clouds. And then from the clouds, they form, um, they eventually compact so hot, so so densely that they heat up and they create fire and that creates suns and that creates planets and that creates the solar system. So the galaxy, galaxies in the universe right now look kind of like 
but look exactly because they're from the temperature differences. So we, we get a better idea of what that looked like. So those red dots represent places where galaxies are or used to be? Uh, so the, the warmer parts are less dense. So the, the, cold, the blue parts are where galaxies are now okay. in our modern universe. But in the early universe, it shows where it was slightly colder, which led through time to what we are now. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask one? Sure, absolutely. Let's ask it while it's really here. Okay. Uh, will you keep contact with your fellow mentor guys or heroes? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so being in a, in a single place for so long, having such an intense interaction with these people, you get to know them very well. Um, and there's some people uh, I believe I'll, I'll talk to for the rest of my life. Um, that's not you know every single person that you would know, but there's it's quite a quite a significant number of people. Well, thank you so Great. much for taking the time. Awesome, thank you. And thanks everybody who joined online. Have a good weekend.